and all these people were putting IVs into the carrot and ECGs and EEGs and all this other stuff and you know, shooting stuff into its body uh, to try and keep it alive. And they ushered their friend uh, into the, the uh, waiting room. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever been in a waiting room of the ICU, the emergency department. It's one of the most tense places you can ever be. People are waiting there, their loved ones, their friends, are on the edge of life and death. And it's so, so scary, even for a cat. And after two hours of raw anxiety, a surgeon came into the room, looked around, and said, you, Mr. Carrot, you must be the friend of the carrot inside the, <laughs> the surgery. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I've, I've got some good news and bad news for you. And the friend carried one of the way. What is it? Tell me what's happening. I'm so afraid. He said, your friend, your friend, Mr. Carrot, he's going to survive. <sighs> said his friend, I was so worried. I thought he was a god. He said, no, he's going to survive. But the bad news is because of his injuries, Because of his injuries, he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've told that, but I can't say it with a straight face. <laughs> it's a stupid It's a very stupid joke. That's why I like it. You don't have to be so perfect. You know, sometimes where you learn this from, it's, many of you actually see that book which I wrote, first book, Open the Door of Your Heart. You don't know maybe why that, where that story, where that book came from. And it was because, you know, I was gathering all these stories over many years, and that one lady came up to me over in Australia, and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was going through a terrible divorce, and those of you who have been through divorces just know that it just, it tortures you. If you have an injury from a car crash, people can see it. But they don't know the injuries, the traumas, the wounds, the slashing and the cutting and the bruising, which occurs when people who choose each other for one reason or another play part a divorce. Dreams and hopes of most of your life get just crumbled. So, she got through this terrible divorce and she said, those stories which I told, even the stupid jokes, have kept her alive. She'd been through this many times, she thought of suicide. But it worked. And she said, it's a crime, which I've got. If you don't share this more widely, by writing them down in the book. And I said, I'm too busy. I've got so many other things to do. I wasn't actually too busy, it's more like too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but then she said, what's this? <laughs> okay. I said, pick it up on my eye and I just went to. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Where was I? It was, I made it to get through suicide. She told me. Why don't you write them in a book? I said, I can't. Too busy. So she said, well, I have your permission. And she was a really smart woman. She totally um, sidestep sidestepped my refusal and used psychology, which just really caught me out. So after writing a couple of stories, she said them to me. They were awful. <laughs> they were terrible. I can't put my name to that. So there's only one alternative. Do it myself. So that's how she got me to write the stories. <laughs> so I just wrote them down. And once I wrote them down, I never published any book before. I didn't know what to do with them. So what had happened was I just had someone put them on the old CD, the old discs. I was going to Melbourne give some talks and I said, can I get them before we go? Because 
I may not find somebody I'll inquire when I get to Melbourne to see if there's any publisher who's willing to look at this. You know what happened? <coughs> the first talk I gave in the University of Melbourne, after the talk, this woman came up and said, that's a wonderful talk. I work in the publishing industry. If ever you have anything you want to publish, please let me know. <laughs> and I just handed it to her, right there and then. But in the front of that book, you will find a little uh, poem. Grant yourself a moment in peace. Grant yourself. You have to give it. Don't expect to get it from other people. Grant yourself a moment of peace. And you'll realize how needlessly you've scurried around. Be kind. And you will notice how your judgment of others was far too severe. And learn to be silent. And you'll realize you talk too much. And I got that a long time ago, and it really meant a lot to me. And this evening's talk, I'm focusing on learn to be kind and you will understand how your judgment of others and yourself is far too severe. You don't have to be perfect to be enlightened, to be happy, to be successful. Think of the kindness. And, many, many times in my life, I always thought I had to, to really strive to live up to the expectations of others, to please others, to be a good monk, to be a good son, to be a good, I don't know what you do in your life, to again, to beat your personal best. It's crazy, isn't it? When every now and again something comes up and you realize you have judged yourself way too harshly. I went once to visit one of the great monks in Thailand. His name was Ajahn Tate. And he lived in a monastery on the banks of the Mekong River. Is it still loud enough? Okay. Okay. On the banks of the Mekong River up in the north. He, not many people knew him, but I knew him because when I first went to Thailand 44 years ago to become a monk, he was in hospital with cancer, incurable looked after by the best doctors in that land. And when they said that there's nothing he could do, he decided it's much better to die in his monastery with his monks on the banks of the, of the Mekong River rather than just die in a hospital. So he went there to die in the back of his uh, monastery. It was about 25 years before he died. He did die, but it took a long time. He was a special monk. And when I went to see him, I was interested in meeting him, but also I had a lot of questions to ask and a lot of fear as well. Because some of these monks could read your mind. And my mind was not ready to read, not in public. Would you like your mind to be read? And all the secrets told to your partner? <laughs> Don't worry, that's an invasion of privacy. And now we're still in the European Union, we have data protection laws. <laughs> <laughs> and I put out of prison if I don't know what you've been thinking. And anyway, if you do read somebody's mind, you read one person's mind and it's trash. It's like reading an ill-written novel, pulp fiction, 
You read one, you don't want to read it again. It's not worth reading. But anyway, this one was very powerful. I was scared what he would read. But nevertheless, I was intrigued with all the list of questions I had to ask him. But as soon as I went into the room to have a personal interview, all my questions disappeared. I wasn't at all afraid. In fact, I've never felt so safe. Stupid ATM. 
Don't curse it. Be kind to it. Stroke it. Dear ATM. Dear ATM. Will you? I'm a bit short of cash this week. <laughs> May you be happy and well. And cop up 20 euros. <laughs> <laughs> The weird stuff, you know, happens in life. <laughs> there was one of my groups over in Perth. They were, were doing a uh, like a youth group. At the end of the youth group, they were going down to the beach. But the uh, the boot of the car was jammed, and they couldn't open it up. And that meant they couldn't go to meet their friends by the beach. And they were trying and trying and trying and trying. Well, for a long time, about 15, 20 minutes, when I happened to walk past. They said, Ajahn Brahm, you've got all the powers. Can you open the booth for me? And they gave me the key. said, I'll open it if you promise to become a bhikkhuni. That was a yeah. <laughs> If you promise to become a bhikkhuni. He said, yeah, okay. Turn the key, open the book. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that. But anyway, what happened next? There was a lawyer sitting next, oh, next to her. And she said, well, okay, I promised to become a bhikkhuni, but I never said in which life. You go off the hook, you don't move on. Well, even machines, sometimes it's amazing, just with some kindness. How you can get them to do weird things and work. Anyway, going back to like the kindness, this monk I saw was just so kind. It was like, you know, a grandmother but you know, without any sort of sharp edges on her. Who just loved you unconditionally. I was just happy to be with you. I was not going to criticize, harm, shun. I had no questions. When you feel with all of your imperfections, with all of your faults, which were still there, totally accepted. You became so peaceful, so at ease. How many people have you been with where you feel totally accepted, where you don't have to change at all? You don't have to improve. You don't have to get better. They're very rare, but they teach you why you are good enough. This is the third talk in a row where I've taught the simile of the forest. Maybe in London there's not enough forest, and the only forests you find are just manicured, uh, are, um, uh, have arborists making sure they're not sick, having people make sure there's no diseases in them. But I'm talking about a real forest, a natural forest, where there are no gardeners. And in those forests, you never find a tree which is straight. And they're all bent and twisted. You never see a tree with all of the branches in the right place. Their branches all over the place, in the wrong place, twisted. Some branches have been torn off or damaged or just bent in half because of the storms and other impact. And the trunks of the trees is all damaged and scarred with knobs and cankers and and other wounds of their journey so far in their life. I've never seen a perfect tree in the sense of one which has never been damaged. And in fact, if I did see a straight tree with all the branches in place and all the leaves green and none of them munched by insects, it would be beautiful. It would be like plastic. It would be imitation, not real. And in fact, all the trees where I find joy and happiness 
the attractive traits, they are the ones which are all twisted and bent and damaged. They are the beautiful traits, the damaged ones. Somehow or other in our life, people say, you're damaged goods, therefore you're stigmatized and you're not accepted anymore. To a lesser or greater degree, we are all damaged goods. Look at me, the bad jokes I say. That's a sure sign of being a damaged monk. <laughs> <laughs> but, if you are damaged good, if you've got history, if you've been wounded and hurt, sometimes you can see it, sometimes it's underneath, but it's there, and we know it's there the trauma of your life so far, the times when you haven't been treated or mistreated or misunderstood, you struggle but it's so hard and you fail, so you think you're no good, you try again and you're again you're beaten down for unfair reasons because you may be a woman or you're different or you're just LGBTQIA or because you're a bikuni or you're a nun or you're something from another race or tradition or religion or whatever. There's so many reasons why people are stigmatized and pulled down and pushed down and trampled on and traumatized. That doesn't mean you're stigmatized. You belong. You belong to this incredible, wonderful, beautiful, varied forest <coughs> called humanity. If you don't believe me, just go into a real forest. Have a look for yourself. And those who've been the most damaged, they're my favourites. They're the beautiful ones. The twisted and bent ones. So if you have a partner who's twisted and bent and crooked and scarred, keep them, they're the best. <laughs> And for goodness sake, don't try and straighten them up. <laughs> Which is where, again, we get caring for. What is actually to care? Have you really been cared for? That monk cared for me 100%. That's why I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to find some super glue and grow me to the ground so they couldn't make me leave. Well, they actually Somebody explained it with the simile of the spikes. Many beings have got spikes coming out from their body, invisible spikes. You can't see them. Some have got very long, very sharp, invisible spikes. You get scratched walking past them in the street. You get too close to them and you feel very uncomfortable. Those are the very angry, nasty people in this world. So spiky. If you want to be kind, <coughs> you get cut when you try to help somebody. Most people have got average spikes. The people you maybe work with, associate with, you don't get cut or, or scratched, but you get too close into their personal space. You get scratched. Some of you, for trusting relationships with somebody. You're close friends, partners even. But you get too close and you get scratched. <coughs> People have got these spikes, long ones, medium sized or short ones. But I hope one day you will meet people with no spikes. You get as close as you like. Right inside of them. He never felt that you're pushed out, that you're scratched, you're hurt, you're hurt. You are totally accepted. Those are the real ones. People with no spikes, they will never harm or criticize you. You can say the most stupid things, make the most terrible mistakes, and they will just laugh. Not because they're putting you down, because they know that life is so absolutely, ridiculously funny. When I first became a monk, I was in Thailand. 
I had to learn the local language. It was not Bangkok time, it was um, Laotian time. It was a poor monastery. So whenever I needed anything, I would go to Ajahn Chah. He had a big water jar. When you got anything, it was in the jar. You need anything, toothpaste, you put it in the jar. Oh, something here, here you go. If there wasn't anything, he didn't have it. So one day I wanted some soap to wash with. The word for soap in Thai is sabu. I made a simple mistake. Sapo instead of sabu. Sapo, I said. Now, sabu is a Thai word for soap. Sapo is a Thai word for pineapple. <laughs> So uh, my teacher actually so I heard I wanted some pineapple. <laughs> and he, you know, he asked me, what do you want pineapple for? And I said, to wash. <laughs> and he almost got off his chair laughing. And he told all the other people, you know, some people from Bangkok said, oh, you know, in England they wash me. They're so advanced. He <laughs> could for their skin. Maybe that's why it's so white. <laughs> <laughs> he never let me forget that. But not with maths. I certainly learned the difference between a pineapple and a bar of soap. But because I realized after a while, that's one of the reasons why this Thai teacher couldn't speak any English. He had so much fun with his Western disciples. We caused so much merit for him. <laughs> oh, this is something. But it was okay to make a mistake. We made our teacher happy. And we learned at the same time. Making mistakes, not being perfect, was not a problem. It was one of the reasons why I sort of learned to develop what today I call the 17% rule. I learned this when I was a school teacher. I was actually a school teacher in Devon for one year, high school, and teaching maths. And of course, when I had to test to set an exam, it was only for uh, I think it was the year before uh, the O levels. So you know, it wasn't that important. But I'd never set an uh, end of the term exam before. I was that end of the term, end of the term, not end of the year. And so I asked my the head of the department, give me some advice, how do you set an exam? And they said, don't make it too hard. Because if it's too hard, the average score of your, you know, 30 kids in your class is saying no, uh, 3 out of 10, 4 out of 10, they will lose motivation. They'll come away with the idea, even though it's a wrong idea, they can't do arithmetic. Because I said, too hard exam. But if it's too easy, they all get 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10, then what's the point of it? Everyone gets a 10 out of 10. It was too easy. So they said, try and set the average score to be 70%. Because 7 out of 10, 70% is a pretty good score. You know, it means, yeah, you can do maths. And the 30% where they make mistakes, that is the most important. Because that's where I, as their teacher, can discover where they never understood things. And in the next lessons I can focus on those points where I thought they understood, but obviously I failed to teach properly. That's where I learned the importance of mistakes. So, if you've got a partner who's 100% problem, you never learn anything that way. <laughs> if they're 5%, drop them also. But if they're 70%, they're the best. There you learn about love, acceptance. That's where you grow. There's no growth if you're already 100%. Same with life. If life went perfectly for you, 
We never had any challenges, any mistakes. It would be a wonderful life, but what would be the purpose? You wouldn't learn or grow anything. So that's why when life is not 100% clear, when things don't go just so smoothly, just trying to find a place for Bikuni Monastery in England, it's tough, it's hard, but if it was easy, you would not learn anything. <laughs> and this, if it's too hard, you give up. So the 70% rule, never expect life to be 100%. Never expect life and yourself to be perfect. Otherwise, you would not grow. And I like that simile because life grows, developing naturally. If you try to make it develop, you stun it. It's a weird thing. But that doctor who came to see me, who wanted to resign. And I'd known him ever since he was you know, just my four or five years of age. And brilliant man, worked so hard to get to the point of becoming a doctor in a hospital. How much sacrifice and hard work that was. When he came to me one lunchtime and said, something happened this morning, I can't do this job anymore. I need to find another job. I'm resigning. I asked why he was resigning. And the problem was that that very morning, one of his patients had unexpectedly died. Never thought that would happen. I never saw the signs. It turned out it wasn't his fault, even the most senior doctor would have seen this, but he felt responsible. And the worst part of it was but as his patient's doctor, a 23-year-old 20, young woman, he was the one who had to tell her husband. And they loved each other so much. They'd been married for a couple of years, and they were looking forward to a long, long life together. And he had to tell him. Surprisingly, he had no wife left. She died. And to add the salt, not the salt, like the chicken pepper, to the wood. That his two young children had no mother. And it hurt him just so much, more than anything else he'd ever experienced in life. When he saw the devastating pain of an unexpected death of a young love, and just wondering just how the hell he's going to look after these two children. This is life again, falling apart. Where's mummy? Can we see mummy now? She's gone. What do you mean she's gone? Kids not understanding. And him having to deal with his own grief and terror of his future. And this young man had to say that to them. And he said, I can't face the possibility of doing that ever again. It hurts too much for me, let alone that poor family. I feel so guilty. And that was where, so I told him, he'd misunderstood the purpose of being a doctor. Your job, your priority, is never to cure people. If you ever think that you, your first priority is to cure, you will have this happen many, many times. You can't always cure people. It's an impossibility. But there's something you can always do. That's to care for people. Care. You never need to feel a failure if you make caring the priority. It doesn't matter who comes into your, your guardianship for that time as, as you know, your patient. You can always care for them. And that changes the whole 
the whole process of being in ICU, in a uh, death, near-death situation, sick, disease. Now you're cared for. I don't know how many of you have been through hospitals, through long illnesses, maybe uh, trying to overcome cancer or other diseases. How many of you feel you've been really cared for? Or just trying this and that to cure you? Especially the end of life situations, where sometimes doctors with good intentions make curing far more important than caring, to the point that the end of life is just so intrusive. Sometimes you think so unnecessary because curing is paramount and caring is relegated to well, maybe if we've got time. Now, the reason I introduce that story is for you. Do you ever try and cure yourself of your bad habits, of your weaknesses, of your faults? You judge yourself say, I've got to cure this one, I've got to cure that one. I've got to cure addictions. And how many people I've seen addicted to this drug, that drug, addicted to pornography, addicted to violence. Has it ever been cured? What's the solution? So many people have told me they're not good enough. They don't deserve to be freed from their addictions. That's the problem. Call part of it. You care for them. Not just care for them, but teach them, encourage them, show them the way to care for themselves. I belong. I'm a tree in the forest too. And actually people really, they actually do love me and who I am. I don't need to cure myself. I care for myself. With that doctor, he told me, I knew this, that by caring for his patients, he cured so many more. And instead of hating the disease and trying to get rid of it, he cared for it, relaxed it, let people feel free. We're talking about this, man, I don't mind mentioning it to you, we saw a couple of his old friends, you know, uh, at his hour. This man, he was above with me some time ago, and he got so sick, he had two types of typhus at the same time. And it was just so sick, I was there at the time. Oh, he was that close, we sent him down to Bangkok and they used all our contacts to have an ambulance waiting for him. This is a real story. Waiting for him at the platform of the main uh, train station in Bulong in Bangkok. And the doctor, I knew him, he said, as soon as I saw him, he thought, one. He won't survive to the hospital. He was that close to death. But they pulled him through, but he was sick. Always sick. <coughs> and we have a monastery down in Chitos. You ever been down there? And when I went to visit many years ago, he was in the attic. You know, I don't know if you've ever read these, these uh, old romance novels, like, was it Jane Eyre or something? where the crazy people, the mad people, were kept in the attic. <laughs> and that's why I, that's why I remember this Mike was out in the attic, and he, he couldn't go out because he was so weak. I had no energy, I had like Crohn's disease or something. And every time he just got to the door, he just had no energy left to go further, and just crawl back to bed. He was bedridden like that for a couple of years. What was the solution? The best medicine, homeopathic, allopathic, 
any empathic, it wasn't psychopathic, I didn't have psychopathic. <laughs> so I had to fix him up until the abbot at that time, good old Ajahn Sumaita, he just had his insight. Trying to do things differently. He went up to the room, remember Kinsara telling me this? Went up to his room, his attic, hadn't been out of the attic for two years, tried but there's to no energy, and said, I've come up here on behalf of all the monks and nuns in this monastery, all the people who come here to feed us, to support us, all of your relations back in Tennessee. He was a Rhodes Scholar from Oxford before. And I always remember, hi y'all. I can't do that. He tried to teach me a long time. How are y'all? <laughs> <laughs> such a, a lively, but he's a champion wrestler as well. So anyway, there he was, all skin and bone. And this abbot, Abbot Sumatra, he said, I come up here on behalf of everybody who knows you and loves you and cares for you, to give you permission to die. You don't to be alive. It's okay to die. We're not going to try and cure you anymore. We're going to care for you. Let you be. See what happens. And apparently he just burst out when he picked cried his eyes out. And from that day on, he got better. Now how many years ago was that? 25 years ago? But he's still alive. I read that. <laughs> Over South Africa. Sorry? Move now, then. Oh, I mean, it's a Anyway, he has an idea. He came so close to dying because he thought he had to get better. To cure himself, to cure himself of. Well, to, no, sorry, to die would be letting down all his friends. All the people, that's the worst thing he could do for them, to die. So when he had permission to die, he started getting better. That's what I mean, if you try and cure somebody, sometimes you're making them sick. <laughs> if you care for them, really care for them, non-judgmental care, it's okay if you die. It's all right. It happens. You don't have to get better. You don't have to be... 10 out of 10. He was a Rhodes Scholar, remember? Successful person for much of his life. He didn't know about failing. Trying to please others was killing him. I don't know if any of you have, have read the book by Anita Amurajani, Dying to Live. I remember seeing videos of interviews with her. He wasn't a Buddhist, he was, I think, a Hindu or Catholic or something, I forget which. But she was sick all her life. But very successful. Great husband, lovely family, uh, on the outside, just a really successful woman. She was in Hong Kong, that's why I found out I'm an Indian uh, working in Hong Kong. Because I got lots of uh, followers in, in Hong Kong. And anyway, that she. Uh, I was having another operation when she died. Died on the operating table. Then it's near that experience. And then she, she told exactly what happened. And it was real, it wasn't imagination. And even the doctors said, how the hell did she hear me say that? It was in another room when I said that. And anyway, but, so it was true. But the nice part about it, that she, she went over to this you know, this nimmer to this light, you know, which is what we talk about in Buddhist meditation, and other types of meditation as well. And anyway, the, she felt so loved, so at peace with herself. No judgment. No sort of trying to be something she isn't. Accepted as a crooked, damaged, uh, not perfect tree. And then, you know, she interpreted that as, as a union, a God experience. You don't need to call it God and then to create
great barriers between religions. Just call it perfect love, acceptance, and peace with who you are. Without anybody trying to judge you or criticize you or change you, not trying to cure you of all your faults. And at that point she realized that she had beaten her cancer. She said, cancer's gone now. Because she realized the whole reason behind it was trying to please others. And the tension, the stress throughout her whole life of never be good enough. Maybe she got that from her teachers. Top of the class, yes, but you get distinctions. Getting top A levels, but you get A level plus. Uh, degrees, but you can always get honours with distinctions. And you can get, I said this other day, you get a master's, MA. I've got one monk who's got two MAs. We call him Mama. <laughs> <laughs> PhD, you can always get another PhD. Where's the end of this? And that was her life. Everyone else would say, wow, you're just so successful. But for her, there's always something wrong. <coughs> and that literally was killing her. Trying to not be who she was. And accepting that she would never be perfect. But try. Perfectionists are some of the worst. They haven't felt and tasted failure. So they don't know how to deal with it. And they strive until it literally kills them. What the heck are you doing that for? Who said you're not perfect? That's why one of my her gripes, my passions, is a self-improvement industry. Who says you're not good enough? Where do you get the idea from? You have to improve. I saw that a long time. <laughs> I've been around now just over 44 years. And every year, you grow in compassion and kindness. <laughs> That's what we do, that's, the, that's our job, you know. Some people just, you know, just learn how to sing. Some people learn how to uh, make bread. I learn how to make tummies. <laughs> and, uh, because every year, your heart gets bigger with kindness. A long time ago, my heart got so big, it was pushing against my ribcage. But I carried on just being kinder and kinder and kinder until my, my, my heart grew so big it pushed down and out the only place to go. <coughs> so 44 years of creating a bigger heart, a wider heart, a more embracing heart, that's why it caused this. It's just a big heart with nowhere else to go except up here. <laughs> Have you ever seen uh, uh, thin monks? They're always pretty mean sometimes. <laughs> Never trust a really thin, skinny, <laughs> spiritual leader. <laughs> they haven't developed their kindness enough. It's too big, right? Have a look. Anyway. But anyway, so. Why are you trying to live up to other people's expectations? <coughs> Control by trying to please others. <coughs> trying to, to live up to what they say you should be. Trying to fit in. I love it when you don't fit in. Sometimes it's very hard to fit into a tube train in my sense. <laughs> Take too much space. <laughs> but not. It's, it's great being different. You don't need to be sort of to fit into everybody else's idea of what you should be. That is stress. Stress and that kills you. So instead, just 
when you not subject to other people's judgments. You don't judge yourself. Nor do you judge others. That means you can just relax and be fun. And that also means if anyone who wants to meditate, become enlightened. What is enlightenment anyway? What is an enlightened person supposed to look like? <laughs> you can't tell. An enlightened, enlightened person is someone who's beyond wanting, beyond um, anger in your world. But nothing to be angry about. Like my teacher, I made a mistake. He didn't get angry at me, he thought it was so funny. When I make a mistake myself, I think it's really funny. I laugh at my own jokes, on my own stupidity. I have great fun, but you don't try and find them, you let people know about them. What was the, some of the, I was not just the, the, uh, what the time? Probably, who cares, I don't know. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> but all the stupid things, oh, okay, one of the stupid things I did, you know, that I have to wear glasses, and reading glasses. Nothing for anything else, but you know when the first time you wear glasses? You know, you wear glasses because you know you look a bit bright. So I was going into town one day, I said, oh my goodness, I'm, 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 I haven't brought my glasses along. Turn around please, we've got to go back and get my glasses. And my driver said, <coughs> I respect you as a teacher, at your but you know sometimes you're very stupid. Have a look on the end of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> you ever done that? <laughs> God, I haven't even thought about it. So anyway, I don't know how many thousands of people I've told about that stupid thing about about not knowing where my glasses were because of the end of my nose. So we all do things like that. But how many times do people actually admit it and be at ease with it and be happy to be making mistakes? Which means you're not judged. When you're not judged, you don't need to strive. You can enjoy. When have you got grandchildren? And they, they, they don't judge you. Hello, Mummy. Hello, Granny. They just love you. That's why you love to be with them. When they get older, they don't love you the same way anymore. Isn't that a shame? So anyway, it's great to learn from a, even a dog or a cat. Especially from dogs. They love you no matter who you are. They sit on your lap, sometimes you come home late. Sometimes, sometimes you, uh, you know, kick them or something, and they never bite you back. Dogs, remember the meaning of this one story about in New York this happened. There was uh, a couple of uh, uh, NYPD uh, officers went to interview a, su a suspect for this crime they thought he had done. Because he was violent, they brought their big police dog with them. Just in case you know, he got sort of a little bit uh, uh, aggressive with them. So this uh, uh, person, who the policemen were interviewing him, they asked him many questions and the dog was just sitting next to the, the suspect and the, the suspect started stroking the dog. And of course, the police dogs, they don't get ever stroked. So they're stroking them, patting them, and the little doggy was really enjoying this, being stroked. And after about an hour of interrogation, the police officers thought, yes, they have got enough evidence to arrest him. So they took out the handcuffs and they went to arrest the suspect. <laughs> and because the suspect had been stroking the dog for over an hour, the police dog attacked and bit two policemen. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
but we have to be perfect to be loved by ourselves. Which is a great tragedy. It shouldn't be that way. So if you can love yourself, care for yourself, don't judge yourself, realize you don't have to be perfect to be happy, then you have a great step towards understanding what enlightenment is. Thank you. comes from a sense of being, has to disappear. So you get so still, and nothing moves. There's no one left to do the moving. So imagine, what well, was that time? I'm in big trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine trying to pin a medal on the air. There's nowhere to hook it. That's like trying to hook uh, a label, enlightened or half enlightened. There's nowhere to, to put that label. That's why a person who says, are you right or not, doesn't really understand what the question is. You disappear. You vanish. Gone. They also, people would ask the same question to the Buddha. They would say that a person who says they're not better than anybody else, they're not worse than anybody else, they're not the same as everybody else. We call those the three conceits, the three judgments, the three measures. Are you better than anybody else? Are you worse? Are you the same? None of them reply. No conceits, no judgments, no feeling better, feeling worse, feeling the same. And that's getting close. Apparently, for the next seven, I told you it would defeat the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so, the book I would recommend for you is uh, Garfield uh, Book of Comics. <laughs> Because <laughs> I saw this comment by Garfield about he would say meditation doesn't work for him. So he tried meditation instead. You no know, meditation? Tucked up in bed fast asleep. <laughs> he said afterwards he feels so relaxed afterwards and so happy but also hungry. If you don't like him. <laughs> Sometimes we read books. Why do we read books for more information? We have an information overload. So the point is that you know, sometimes this monk says something, this expert says something else, this expert says something else. There's so many experts. So sometimes I recommend a book for light relief. Really. There's not enough happiness to join this world. So read a comic. Thank you.